Hello and welcome. This is Pastor Christopher Morundi of the Lutheran Institute of Regenerative Agriculture. It is my great joy to have with us today Rory Groves, who is a, a farmer in, in southern Minnesota um, and, a, and a thinker about agriculture and a speaker and uh, hosts conferences out there and all that sort of thing. Also the author of this book, Durable Trades, which we have talked about on a on a Lyra podcast before. So I'm very, very excited to have, have the author here uh, to, to talk about these things. Things. And you can certainly watch our longer form podcast, the 30 minute or so one that we recorded. And then we have just let's get this smaller one to kind of let you uh, get a little bit of um, uh, hear from Rory for just a little bit. So, uh, Rory, if you could just give us just a, a brief little bio of of how you, of, of who you are and how you ended up on the farm. Uh, yeah, thank you again, Chris, for allowing me to be on the podcast. I appreciate it and appreciate um, you sharing about the book. Uh, you know, my background is I was a computer programmer my entire career. I grew up around high tech. I got a job uh, early out of college. Uh, I, I majored in computer science and been working my entire career in high tech. And about 10 years ago, we moved our family out to a farm, a small little acreage in Southern Minnesota. And that began, I didn't, I wasn't leaving high tech at the time, but that began my curiosity with farming and agriculture. And over a number of years, I started to realize that this hobby farm that we were at was actually more real than my real job. In, in other words, that there was more tangible benefits and more uh, fulfillment and life-giving wisdom coming off the farm than there was on a computer screen or in a cubicle. So uh, that kind of one thing led to another, and I ended up um, doing some research on historical family-based businesses uh, because I wanted to know, is, is it possible for families today to actually pursue something together rather than apart? Because that's one of the hallmarks of the family farm. Of course, it's in the name. <laughs> it's a family. So, so the family farm motif, I just want to know, are there other options out there? And I was pleasantly surprised to find out that, yes, in fact, there are dozens of trades that are still viable, that they can still produce a viable income for families who want to work together and do something that's more integrated in with creation and with community and more sustainable than maybe some other modern counterpart jobs are today. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, let's just launch into it then. If you could briefly kind of describe your criteria and then and then give us the give us the ones that if you know, of course, in 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 a five minute podcast, five six seven minute podcast, what are the top ones you want you want uh, us to sure. know about? So uh, the way that I approach the book is I just I wanted to get a a sense of what was the most durable. Like I was tired of seeing my profession become obsolete, which it I was used to it at that point, but it was very irritating, <laughs> but the continuous retraining, I wanted to know what, what kind of professions are going to be around for a long time, not just like another 20 years, but for like another 200 years, because I wanted to build something that would be an inheritance to my children and, um, and, and give them a start in life with more opportunities and freedom uh, to pursue something that was more healthy for their families. So any, so in any event, um, I, I looked at historical professions that were around before the Industrial Revolution. That was kind of my main litmus test, or my main cut was, did the profession exist prior to about 1800, and does it still exist today? Because I figured if you look at that period of time, I mean, it's one of the most tumultuous uh, periods and in, in certainly in American history, you would have gone through revolution and you would have gone through civil war and you would have gone through, um, of course, industrialism, um, all kinds of, of different pressures on the job uh, force and on the job market and the labor market and the family and all these things. So my my way of looking at it is that if it could survive those that period of time in American history, then it's very likely going to be around for the foreseeable future. Um, I went about classifying these trades according to, so I had to come up with a way to score and rank them. And I came up with five main criteria, which was historical stability, which we kind of talked about a little bit, how much has the trade changed over time? Um, and then we, and then I looked at resiliency, you know, how does a certain trade do during a recession? How fast does it bounce back from an economic issue and how vulnerable is it to supply chain issues, which was funny because I wrote this book before the pandemic and 
Um, we've seen a lot of these predictions come to pass where something breaks down in the supply chain and all of a sudden you can't, you can't fill orders. Um, I looked at family centeredness, how, you know, how much opportunity is there for families to work together in the trade, such as uh, can little children be part of it? Can older adults be part of it? Can men and women contribute? Uh, can it be home-based? Uh, and does it generate assets for future generations? Uh, then I looked at income. Where does a typical, you know, median salary fall in the trade compared to other trades? And is it still livable? Is it something you can still earn an income? I mean, you can, you know, still put provide for your family from that trade. And finally, uh, what were the barriers to entry? Does it require a lot of formal education? Does it require an inordinate amount of startup costs? You know, minor is one of them in the trades. It doesn't rank very high because you need like $5 million or something crazy to open a to open a mine. But it is a trade that has been around for hundreds of years. So there are still family mines out there that uh, got started and have continued. Um, so anyway, there's all kinds of different categories and reasons why there these trades are listed in this book. And uh, I hope that my main goal is that it could be a resource for other families that are like ours, that we're realizing that there's something is not well with the world and we need to start taking things into our own hands and starting at home. What can we do to become more self-sufficient and to become more independent and, and make a better future for our own families? So that that is the the overall kind of thumbnail sketch of the book. So so what would be just a couple of the the big top ones that that jumped out of you of course we i mean we talk about agriculture and maybe maybe we i you know obviously you you and i both uh, agriculture is a big topic on our minds but let, let's maybe think about a couple of the others so so throw out throw out a couple others besides sure. besides farmer that uh, uh and maybe can go right alongside agriculture that that maybe would surprise people that that they're that these are durable that these are still viable today that these are these are professions to go toward uh, one of the most uh, interesting ones that I think is very viable and, and and affords a lot of opportunities to families today would be that of innkeeper. That one ranks in, I think, at number nine or 10 in my book um, in terms of the, you know, the top 20 trades are the most family centered and the most durable. But you look at innkeeper, that one goes back, there's, you know, verses in the Bible about inns. And so there were travelers needing a place to stay in a temporary shelter and Today, we've seen a resurgence of innkeeping in, you know, the average family can open up an Airbnb and actually make a substantial income, oftentimes paying for the property itself um, through, you know, one or two Airbnb units. Um, maybe many of your listeners have heard of people and success stories like that, and it's very real. There's very steady demand for these kinds of things. It doesn't mean there won't be ebbs and flows. Of course, if we have recessions that are you know, predicted, there, there might be cutbacks and curtails. But in terms of a profession, it's very durable. And I gave the example, uh, um, one of my talks of a friend of mine who moved to um, a 20-acre uh, farm. It had two houses on it. And he bought the property with the intention of renovating the second house and, and renting it out. And so he did that. Uh, I think he put in, um, you know, something like ten to fifteen thousand dollars in renovations, and then rented it out. And he said within uh, within three months from the point of when he started doing the Airbnb rentals, the property was paying for itself. So he had moved into a, a, a fairly large thing that he probably wouldn't have been able to afford if it were not for the Airbnb. Well, he definitely wouldn't have been able to afford it without the Airbnb income sub subsidizing his family's ability to live there. So now he's working on doing the other agricultural things that he's wanted to do, which by the way, I will stress, this is one of the main themes and takeaways in the book is to have, uh, to be uh, historically stable, families would, in, uh, would be employed in multiple trades. They would not just do one thing. I mean, even farming itself really encompasses a lot of different things. But you would have, for example, you know, Ben Franklin was a statesman and he was an inventor and he was um, a publisher and an author, you know, so they did many of these different things. That would be another one. Author is in the book. Um, that's a durable trade, a durable profession. It may not be a sole source of income for families, um, but it might be a partial source of income. We've moved into the authoring trade in our family. We wrote this book. We have other books that we're working on and we publish a family newsletter every quarter. 
that we put a lot of effort into, but it's been one of the ways that um, we're able to keep talking and teaching and providing for our own family. So um, that's innkeeper and author. Uh, midwife is a very interesting one, one that's restricted for the most part, not exclusively, but for the most part to women. But this is a very viable trade that a lot of women can get into, uh, especially younger women if they want to. And if they start families and need more time, they can ramp up or ramp down the amount of time they put in. But this profession is um, really made a comeback. It's grown about 300% in the last, I don't know, 10 or 20 years. Um, so that's one to watch out for. Uh, I like woodworker a lot. And this is one in particularly I'm trying to help my 12-year-old son, Ivor, get involved in woodworking, specifically custom-made uh, furniture pieces or cabinetry or any woodworking would be the, the kind of finer detail types of uh, craft, not the rough construction, which carpenter is in there too, but um, the finer woodworking side of things is a very durable trade. And for people who have a penchant for it and have a skill and a gifting for it, it can be a very uh, well-paying profession and you can be home-based. You know, you can have a shop on your own property and uh, your kids can be involved in it. So that's a that's one that I really like right now. And I, like, as I said, I'm trying to set up some of our own kids for that. Is that good? You want me to keep going? That's great. That's wonderful. I I think that the trades, I, and this would be kind of my last, my last question as we, as we close, um, the, the trades have, have kind of always kind of been looked down upon to a certain extent. Um, and, and you mentioned that, I think it's the last chapter of your book and, you know, so someone will say, well, I don't want my, my child to grow up, my son to grow up to be a, just, just be a plumber. And you say in the book is exactly the comment I had. Have you ever tried to pay a plumber before? <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> the, the, I mean, the, the, you know, electrician plumber at the, the little town I grew up in the best Christmas lights in town was the plumbing family, you know, because that, that's, that's good work yeah. and, uh, and we all need them. So oh, yeah. same thing with all these other trades. So, so just uh, give us just a quick little uh, defense of the trades. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's uh, just vanity, I guess. I don't know what else to say. I mean, people who earn, who, the, the, the folks that I interviewed for my book who are working in these trades, they all made more than I did as a computer <laughs> programmer. So you have to put that to death with the fact that you don't make any money in the trades. That's totally not true. If you're an owner, and that, and that can be a key distinction, if you, if you are going in to do a very menial task in a larger company that performs trades, yeah, okay, you're going to get you know minimum wage. But if you are actually uh, uh, an expert in that trade, or, or you've, you've apprenticed or become a journeyman or a master in that trade, you're going to come in significant. And by the way, these prices are going sky high because no one is coming up through the ranks to take these jobs. All they, they tell me all the time when they're going in for their um, licensing classes, everyone in the room is 50 years and older, and these guys are not going to be able to keep working indefinitely. There are no 20, 30 year olds coming up in the ranks to take their places. So that means, I mean, we're going to see a huge increase in prices across the board for trades. That's very good news for any young person that doesn't want to sit in a cubicle and punch on a keyboard their entire life. They can get out, they can get some fresh air, they can do things outside, move around, be mobile, maybe be home-based. You know, like I said, um, there's a lot of opportunity in the trades. I think there, there is a stigma there that has to say in our society, and I talk about this called the vital lie. There's a stigma there that uh, trades are only for uneducated, you know, dropouts. It, the educated people are the ones that, you know, that's where you really earn your money. That's where you, you know, statistically, that's where you're going to get your most. That's a bunch of hooey. It has a lot more to do with the mentality of ownership and responsibility and work ethic than it does of where you got your college degree. And the fact of the matter is a lot of the tradesmen, most of the tradesmen that I talk to are earning double or triple the white collar counterparts in a lot of these office jobs that I've also worked with. So that's that's where some of it comes. I think probably the stigma around trades is going to start to recede into oblivion as artificial intelligence starts to displace the vast majority of white collar workers. That's going to come as a rude surprise within the next 10 years. And so if you don't have skills and something tangible that robots can't do, my, now might be a good time to learn some. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Rory, for, for your time with us this today. And, and thank you for writing this book. And we'll put we'll put a description, uh, a link to where you can purchase it uh, below the show today, as well as a link to their to to the Grovestead uh, uh, website where you can sign up for their newsletter. Thank you so much, Rory, for being with us today. You're very welcome. I appreciate the opportunity to share. Have a wonderful day, everyone.